check. Welcome back after the break. Uh, we look at the last lesson in fulfilling God's purpose for our life. Okay. The last lesson is finishing your course. So can the, some of you just tell me what we were learning from chapter, you know, from the very beginning. Just a few points. Okay, Anand, yes? Okay, Anand says, fulfilling God's purpose for our life is not going to be easy. Okay, we can have even our online students contribute. Okay, um, we're looking at the last chapter, so we are just reviewing what we have learned um, throughout. So can you share what are some of the points that you learned? You have to bear the cost, okay? Okay, you have to make sacrifices. Yes, Nina? Okay, the sacrifices, daily sacrifices, life sacrifices, what else? Okay, you have to, it can be fleshly-led sacrifices or spirit-led sacrifices. What did we study in the previous lessons? Sorry? If you want to uh, have a fruitful life, you have to die to the things of this world, okay? We are called to partner with God, thank you, to fulfill our purpose or His purpose. His purpose for our lives, okay? What is the basic thing we learned? The first, uh, the nine guideposts, we basically first learned that God has a plan and purpose for our lives. He has places that he wants us to go, lives he wants us to touch, people he wants us to impact, uh, you know, nations he wants us to, um, you know, uh, cities that he wants us to transform, nations he wants us to shake. Okay, so he has great big plans for us. Does he reveal his plans for us? Yes, and so we saw uh, that, you know, the nine guideposts to how God communicates his plan and purpose. And um, so he can use one or more of the nine guideposts to lead us, to guide us. Okay, uh, now if you have discovered God's plan and purpose for your life, um, yeah, we have some answers from uh, from our online su students. Surya says, sacrifice and surrender to God. Uh, sacrifice and uh, uh, surrender our life to God. Jachin says, spirit-led sacrifices to please God. Okay. Anything else you all learned? Online students? Yes, Sean? Very good. Im very important to fulfill God's purpose for our lives. We need to position ourselves rightly at the right time, the right place, doing the right thing so that we can receive God's provision, His blessing, uh, and we can fulfill God's assignment for our lives. Surya says being transformed. Okay, thank you. So these are some of the things that we learned. We're looking at the last chapter now. Okay, so now if you have discovered God's plan for your life and you're ready, you know, you're all ready to jump in and start your journey to fulfill His purpose, um, you know, and somewhere along the line, you can give up, right? You can give up saying it's not good, it's difficult, um, but it can be difficult. It will not be easy. I told you all the days of your life will not be very exciting, happy. Uh, you will not feel, you know, the josh, you will not feel the excitement. Some days you will not feel the anointing. Some days, you know, Sometimes you feel like a sinner, which you know, serving God, um, all of those things. But irrespective of, we don't depend on our feelings. We just go on what God has called us, what He's asking us to do. You know, God will um, help us uh, with our failures. He will correct us and He will guide us. But we need to finish our race and not give up. Yes, Sean. I 
I think we're all in the same boat with you. All of us don't understand the entirety of scripture. You know, we're all struggling. I know we all are struggling. But just, just to, you know, um, to encourage you. Uh, yeah, so, you know, that will get us to go deeper into. What if we read everything and we just know? Oh, we know everything. Then sometimes we say, why do we even read the word? But, you know, when we read God's word, we're like, okay, what does it say? Where else? So we go to other scripture passages we're trying to find out. And we know it takes us deeper into uh, meditation, into uh, reading God's word. And also it takes us, um, depends more on the Holy Spirit to inspire us, uh, to help us understand. And when, when we receive some revelation, like, wow, we received this revelation. We're so excited about it. Yeah, so it's a good thing to, yeah, not like, you know, you said not stop there. Oh, I didn't understand it. Okay, there's some things in scripture I don't understand. That's a totally different attitude. But having your attitude is so important. You search scripture to find the answer. Okay, so we don't give up. We finish our race. Luke chapter 14, uh, 27 to 35. So can somebody read, please, uh, Luke chapter 14, um, 27. 7, 28, 29, and 30. Nina says we need to recognize the stirring within the spirit of man as a lamp of the Lord. Yes, we uh, we recognize uh, we learned the nine guideposts. So one of the guideposts you're mentioning here is recognize the stirring within. Thank you, Nina. And also, yes, we need to depend on the spirit of God uh, because the spirit of God uh, reveals things in the spirit of man. Because the spirit of man is a lamp of the Lord in which he enlightens us, reveals things to us. Thank you, Nina. Okay. So uh, can somebody read Luke chapter 14, verse 27? Yeah, that's enough, Anand. Yeah. So here, you know, Jesus is saying that we need to count the cost before we jump into or begin the journey of what God is calling us to do. So these verses very clearly tell us that. Okay. So if somebody is building a tower, will he not sit down and think about the cost? How much money I need? You know, how much I need for foundation? How many flows? You know, what all of the things that we need? Okay, whether he has enough to finish it. He won't start and then keep thinking how to get the money. Okay, um, so he says that, you know, uh, if he does not do, then he will just lay the foundation and he will not be able to finish. And all who see it will make fun of him. So somebody who started building but did not count the cost. The same thing goes in, uh, in our spiritual lives as well. When God calls us to do something, you know, you have a calling to be a pastor. God is calling you to be a pastor. That's great. You're very excited about it. You're happy. Uh, it's wonderful. You tell everybody about that. But it's important for you to sit down. You know, you found God's purpose for your life. But it's important for you to sit down and count the cost. Meaning, what does it take for me to become a pastor? What does it take for me to become who God has called me to be? So what am I going to do? You plan the future, okay? You plan five years down the line. You plan 10 years down the line. You just don't rush into it, but you plan. You say, okay, I don't have enough theological knowledge, so I will go to a theological college. How many years I'll invest in the theological college? Where is the finances I'm going to get for it? You know, okay, uh, I also want to get married. You know, how well I'm going to get married and study, what am I going to do, or am I going to get um, finish my studies first, then get married, you know, and all of those things you have to plan before you jump into doing anything. The same with even in the world, you know, you, uh, you're starting a business, you just don't say, okay, I got a dream, I saw myself sitting in... Um, you know, uh, a, a restaurant or bakery. So I'm going to start a bakery. You just don't go the next day, look for a shop and start a bakery. You're going to learn, think about the equipments you need, the 
uh, all the uh, you know the people you need the manpower you need how much you're going to pay them you're going to study other bakery businesses or hotel businesses and then it will take time for you to see the right place to venture in what kind of cuisine what kind of food all of that needs planning the same way even uh, it are calling in uh, life so don't rush into it okay uh, when we plan it can help us to successfully finish our race okay planning is actually having foresight what is the meaning of foresight that means thinking about things that will come in the future okay thinking of things that will come up in the future so for example you're planning to have um, uh, uh, you're trying to open a restaurant here in this area then if you say i'm going to open a restaurant here you cannot uh, you know you can say okay this area is okay but why don't i open it somewhere near krista jenty college you know so i'm opening a krista jenty college uh, now if i have sambar and idli and uh, rice the students obviously don't like sambar rasam and uh, idli and dosa and all that you know there's already a restaurant that is serving that you know you know young people like uh, spaghetti and uh, pasta and pizza and um, you know uh, burgers and sandwiches and you know, so that they can quickly take it and you know run to class keep it and eat it it's not something that spills so you're thinking about all of these strategies before you get into your business okay and how you can be different from other businesses around you so that your business can uh, prosper okay so you need to have foresight before what if some other person comes and starts a restaurant they also have something like this how is mine going to be very unique compared to theirs how can i keep my customers to my uh, the sun so it's not just about uh, you know um, the products that you have but you have quality products tasty products you introduce innovative things and you also you know um, uh, you know you have a good rapport with uh, the people okay now in my area where i stay in indranagar you know there is a new uh, place that's opened up um, and you know this people just flock there you know they open at 6:30 till about 1 o'clock in the night why because they have that many customers and if you look around there are so many restaurants serving idli dosa and pongal and all of those things but these people it's selling like hot cakes you know there's so much of rush traffic gets uh, you know stuck at their shop but why and i went and checked it out because there's some unique innovative ideas they have from the rest of them who are making idli and dosa and chutney and sambar you know but everybody is running to their shop in spite of them eating idli dosa for so many years so these people have become very unique and that is why they are just bringing in customers and they having from 6:30 i've gone to 7 o'clock in the morning there's rush you go at 11 o'clock 11:30 12 1 o'clock there is rush in that shop okay so how can you be very very innovative so you need to think and plan and anticipate upcoming events and then decide on the course of action now there's a bible teaches that we need to plan there's a bible teaches that we need to plan yes no some people say no the bible does not teach us to plan because god jesus tells us don't worry about tomorrow <laughs> don't worry about tomorrow the bible is telling us don't worry about tomorrow but it's not telling us don't plan about tomorrow some of us are so worried about tomorrow that we fail to plan and that becomes an extra worry and burden for us okay so the bible teaches us to plan let's look at some uh, scripture passages it's all given in your uh, notes proverbs chapter 4 verse 26 says ponder the path of your feet and let all your ways be established okay ponder the path of your feet that means ponder means what think deeply about the way you are going what path you are taking what direction you are going how you are living your life proverbs chapter 6 verse 6 to 8 can somebody read that please proverbs chapter 6 verse 6 to 8 So God is telling, learn from whom, and the smallest creature, you know, we don't even sometimes see and stamp it. 
you know, saying learn from that ant. What do you learn from that ant? What are we learning? Supposed to learn from the ant? How to? To work hard, okay? Unity, how to plan? How to plan? Okay, what does the ant do? It has no overseer, has no leader telling them what to do, what not to do. But what does the ant do during summer? It is storing up food for the winter because it knows during winter it cannot gather food. Okay, so the ant is teaching us to plan. So God can even use the smallest thing to teach us sometimes some things. Okay, so next time you look at the ant, think about planning. Maybe God is reminding you about planning. Okay, can somebody please read Proverbs? Um, what is the meaning of go to the ant, you sluggard? Who is a sluggard? Lazy, slow moving, dull moving person. Okay. Proverbs chapter 14, verse 8 and 15. Can somebody read that? Proverbs 14, 8 and 15. Yeah. So here it's talking about a prudent man or a prudent woman. Okay. Man is very general. Don't think women are left out. Okay. Uh, anthropos is a Greek word. Anthropos means human being. Okay, but when it's it's um, translated, they use men, but it's also women here. So women don't think that we are left out. Okay, so prudent here means be a prudent person is somebody who is wise, careful, cautious, and practical. So here it's you know it says you know a prudent man, a wise man understands his way, knows where he's going, knows what he's doing. He considers well his steps, what he is doing. So ask yourself. You know, the way I'm going, the path I'm going, the way I'm preparing myself, is it to fulfill God's purpose for your life? If you find some path or something that you're doing which is not, you know, going on this, you know, uh, pull, helping you fulfill God's plan or purpose for your life, you need to stop going on that path. You need to take the right path, walk on the right path. So you need to be prudent, okay? Proverbs chapter 22, verse 3. Can somebody read that, please? Yes, a prod, prudent man, a wise man, a careful man, you know, a smart man has foresight, is able to see things in the future, things coming in the future, is able to plan, to prepare, uh, you know. So here we see that, you know, he sees the dangers coming ahead and he's able to take precautionary action which will preserve his life. Okay, so we need to be like the prudent man. So Bible really clearly says that we need to plan, prepare, and have foresight. Plan, think about the future, plan for the future. See things that will come up in the future and prepare in advance. Now, when God gives you, uh, you know, God's plan and purpose for your life, you need to sit down and, you know, prepare a plan. Okay, and when you prepare your plan, of course, you are using your own wisdom, your understanding, your own knowledge. But once you prepare your plan, you can say, God, this is my plan. You call me for um, ministry, and I want to go into full time ministry. God, uh, you want me to be a pastor, so I want to go to Bible college, equip myself. So I'm going to go to this Bible college because it's a good Bible college, it takes four years. Or here, I'm going to this Bible college, it's three years. I'll just test it out the first year and if it's good then I will do all the three years uh, but got three years for the son and after that I plan to get uh, you know um, uh, plan to go back to my place and then I plan to work under my pastor or you know I, I plan to work under pastor Rashish because I can learn so much from him or I plan to learn from some other pastor in the city I learn from him and then God in that meantime as I'm you know preparing and uh, equipping myself how to be a pastor I'm going to get married and then you know uh, maybe five years I would have prepared myself and after that you know God I'm going to go to the place that you have called me to go back to Chhattisgarh or to UP or Dehradun or wherever and I'm going to plant a church okay but then after you have planned it you can say God this is my plan no you're willing to step you you're willing to you know I'm willing for you to step in and change whatever you want because I'm doing this according to my wisdom my knowledge no, but this is your will for my life. But God, I'm will, I'm willing for you to 
change. Have your way in my life. Show me what you want me to do, and I will just do that. So when we do that, you know, we need to uh, be uh, ready for uninterrupted changes. Okay, or you can you need to be open to heavenly interventions that God will bring in. God may step in and change things in your plan that you have um, a planned, okay? And we need to be willing to accommodate that and not say, God, no, this is my plan. I decided this, I'm going to go by this, okay? Yes, you planned it according to your wisdom and knowledge, but you've opened it to God. You've given God your plan and God is stepping in and doing what is good for you. Then you can say, yes, God, I'm willing to give this up. I'm willing to step into what you want me to do. Uh, change this around, maybe not five years um, being with this pastor two years, or maybe you want me to go straight away to Dehradun and be under this pastor, I'll do that, God, whatever, you know, um, be willing to change. Because the Bible says the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, okay? So when we plan also, we don't plan according to our own will, but we plan according to God's own will so we submit and surrender ourselves to god's own will let's look at an example in first corinthians chapter 1 verses 15 to 17 first corinthians chapter 1 verses 15 to 17 uh yes read on 16 and 17 16 also Thank you. Okay, so here we see that Paul is planning his travel itinerary. Okay, what, where and all he plans to go. And then he asks a question, do, they, do I plan this according to the, according to the, what does he say? Look at verse 17. The, the things I plan, do I plan according to the flesh? So what is the answer? Does he plan according to the flesh? No, he plans according to the spirit. You know, we see that Paul is constantly led by the spirit. He does what the spirit asks him to do. So we can plan according to the spirit or we can plan according to the flesh. Okay. In John chapter 16 verse 13, Jesus said, the Holy Spirit will show you things to come. Okay. So you and I as believers, we have the privilege. You know, what is the privilege? We have heavenly forecast. You know, weather forecast it will tell us what is going to happen. Business forecast, you know that. You know, stock market forecast, it will tell you how the stock market is going to happen. Like that, we have heavenly forecast. Okay? So you and I are very privileged because we have heavenly forecast. The Holy Spirit forecasts or warns us or tells us things that are going to come and the things that we need to get prepared for. But the Holy Spirit is willing to give you the heavenly forecast, but you must be willing to Listen, you need to be tuned into the Holy Spirit. Only when you go and tune into the weather forecast, you will know what's the weather for today, right? Others, you can just assume now the sun is shining, but suddenly it can change. The weather can uh, change, okay? Uh, and, you know, ch weather changes very, very drastically, okay, in some places. Okay, so you see that the Holy Spirit will tell you beforehand you need to get ready and you need to begin to plan according to what the Spirit is leading you too. So when it's, the Spirit will, Holy Spirit will, you know, give you the warning, He will also give you the strategies and He will also help you. Okay. So in your plan, you need to take the Holy Spirit as your senior partner. Okay. All of us in fulfilling God's plan and purpose for your life, who is your senior partner? Holy Spirit. Okay. He's your senior partner. You know, we need to, you know, uh, develop spirit, uh, implant, uh, in, uh, you know, inspired plans. The spirit will, Holy Spirit will imp, uh, inspire us, tell us what to do. You know, I always depend on the Holy Spirit for everything. I'm not a very, um, you know, I have some sense of creativity, but I'm not a very creative person. But, you know, doing children's ministry, everything I get download from heaven. 
the Holy Spirit will tell me. Like, you know, even for, uh, you know, when we have to have BBS or kids conference or do something in children's church, some activity, something, is the Holy Spirit will give me the download. Just tell me what to do. I'll just go do it. But I just have to work hard to prepare, to think and everything. But Holy Spirit will give the download. You know, even what is the title, what is the, you know, theme, uh, what uh, topics to be taught in children's church, all heavenly download. You don't have to worry. See, so once you are totally inspired by then it's so it's so exciting. You know, even when I joined APC, uh, I was thinking of I joined in for the school outreach ministry and I was asking God what is uh, I was looking at all the possible topics, uh, you know, uh, names that we can call the school outreach ministry of APC. And I had a long list. And then I was I remember I went back home and I was just lying on my bed and say, God, what would you want to call the school outreach ministry? Pop the answer came catalyst. You know, I never thought of catalyst. Catalyst just came. And I put on all the names I thought of and I put catalyst and I sent it to all the pastors and everyone chose catalyst. See? So, you know, everything, all the programs that I have done for children's church, I know it's it it has children have enjoyed it. They're very happy. But everything is a download of from God. Even when I'm just walking and thinking, you know, I go for my evening walks and thinking, God, how to decorate this uh, whole theme for uh, children's church for kids conference he will suddenly show me somewhere I remember I was thinking once God how to do decorations for the kids conference this year and suddenly I was walking and I saw one uh, play school and they had you know they had hung things in uh, in a circle and they had written all those things in the uh, you know in this in that printed circle it's like wow this is a nice idea God thank you and you know we we just did that and the children entirely enjoyed it after the kids conference everybody all the children said they wanted that auntie we want this they all took it and they went and hung it in their home so you know everything is just spirit led so you know the spirit can give you inspired ideas he can give you amazing ideas and you can when you just depend on him but the important thing to know is you know uh, sometimes what we do is you know we we take two extremes we just take uh, you know we're just waiting what the spirit is telling us to do and uh, we just do that and sometimes we are just going with what our mind is telling us to do okay but both need to operate together okay yes the spirit will give us the ideas but the god also uses our mind he's given us our mind he's given us our thinking he's given us our logical thinking reasoning uh, uh, our faculties of the mind and we need to use it okay so don't uh, leave out your brain okay you need to use your brain to Create those innovative ideas which the Holy Spirit is giving you. And don't always, you know, just say, okay, I'm waiting for the Spirit to be to be led. And the Spirit is not telling me anything, so I'm not going to do anything for kids' conference this year. Because the Holy Spirit is not giving me any ideas. No. I mean, we can't do that, okay? So we, um, we need to have a balance. Sometimes we are so Spirit-led, you know, uh, that we can we can make a mess of it. Sometimes we are so led by the uh, flesh that we use latest techniques, modern techniques, uh, tools, and all of that, and we fail to hear what the spirit is telling us. And then we think, why did this whole thing become a failure? I use modern techniques, use the latest things. I thought the youth will like it, the children will like it. Nothing happened because it was not spirit led as well so you have to have your spirit led also use your brains your mind your logical reasoning and your thinking okay there's some comments here about spirit inspired planning by pastor jack hayford written here uh, basically this is the same thing that you know when we need to when we take on anything it has to be we have to have a clear sense of direction from the holy spirit you can look at your notes the bullet points um, when we're doing things to promote our ministry, you know, it needs to be dependent on the Holy Spirit, not on the human, you know, mind thinking, logical understanding, reasoning. And we also need to pursue the things of God that is worship, relationship with people, unity, maintaining unity, uh, discipleship and ministry. When you're planning, all these things are important. And prayer is very, very important okay most important thing is prayer we do everything else leave out prayer no it doesn't really work pray much often and always okay and wait for the holy spirit to give you clarity and con uh, conviction and lead you and guide you and also the he says you know it's important to have faith because without faith it's impossible to 
please God. Okay. Then we look at the ending bit. We have to run till the finish line. Okay. Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. Very important. Can somebody read that, please? Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. Thank you. So here this verse clearly, these two verses tell us clearly what we need to do to ensure that we run our race and finish it. We get to the finish line. The first thing, can anyone tell me what we need to do to ensure to run our race from this? Lay aside every weight. Thank you, Rin. Lay aside every weight. That means what? You know, when an athlete runs, he does not run with all his backpack and, uh, you know, with gear and all that. You know, he doesn't run with all of those things, head gear and feet and all that. He runs as light as possible. Okay. So even when we are running our race, we need to lay aside every weight means what? Yes. So what is a weight? Bad thoughts, your dis uh, distractions, what else? Your, your burdens, the past. So some of us are still holding on to our past. It's such a burden on us. You know, when you're, when you're carrying something heavy, you are... You know, you faint, you'll, you'll be faint-hearted, you'll, you'll be so heavy-hearted, you'll be so uh, tired, exhausted, leave everything about the past. There's nothing you can do about your past. You can't go back there, you can't rectify things, you can't change things. Just continue looking in the present, okay, running your race. Can we, can we run a 100 meters ra race looking at the back? No, it cuts our speed. You know, I did that once when I was in Bible college. I took part in the in the race. I qualified for the finals of the 100 meters race. And it was all, um, you know, none of our students qualified. I was the only student who qualified uh, among the ladies. And all of them were, uh, you know, our faculty children. All small children. I was like already thinking I'm going to lose the race because I was thinking all of these children are so much faster. And there was one girl called Jamaima. She was from Manipur. You know, she was the fastest runner in her school. And I already had assumed that she's going to be first and I'm going to be last. And all these people are going to laugh at me. All this already in my mind. So when I started running the race, I was actually the, the 75 meter mark. I was leading. Suddenly, you know, this whole thing hit me. He said, I can't lead. I can't come first. I can't be first because these other children are faster than me. And I turned around and Jemima was just behind me. I thought I had done a false start and I'm just running the race. You know, look at all these thoughts. It taught me a big lesson in life. I ran and I just looked back. I cut my speed. I looked back and Jemima, she beat me out just in the little distance everybody was shouting at me at a, don't you know when you're have to run the race you have to look in front why did you stop why did you look back and i didn't tell anybody what was going through my mind okay so don't look back there's no point you know the devil will always remind you of your past but you remind him of his future some of us are still living in the past so when you're living when you're turning back you can never move forward leave the past walk in the the future that God has for you. Yes, Sean. <laughs> True. Thank you, Sean, for that example. So Sean is giving us an example of the horse when they go for the horse race. Uh, you know, they they cover the, the horse's uh, eyes so that their horse doesn't see and it's just focused in the front. Okay. What is the second thing we need to do to ensure to uh, run our race? 
First one is lay aside every weight. Second one. Before run with endurance. Look at your the sun. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1. Look into Jesus. Before looking into Jesus, faith, what is given there? Lay aside every weight and then the sin that so easily entangles. Don't forget that. Sin can stop you or hinder you from running your race. You can just get so caught up in it. You know, sometimes, you know, Satan is so smart. He can just put things in our life that will just totally divert our attention rather than focusing on what Christ wants us to do. It can even be people. You know, people can come, you can say, okay, people are gossiping about me, talking about me. Okay, let me uh, let me find out what they're saying. Let me, you know, get back to them. Let me uh, do this. You know, all that is a waste of time. You know, that is going to create disunity. That's going to create uh, division. That's going to eat up your peace of mind, everything. So I don't focus on what people are saying besides me. Okay, I know that people are saying this and that, I can hear this and that, but I'm saying, God, you deal with them. I have no time, no energy. I'm just going to do what you want. And God deals with all of those people. He just moves what who he has to move. He removes who he has to remove. He keeps who he has to keep. And who he has to keep, he even shows them what uh, is their attitude. They come in line, we just work. But I just try to maintain the unity of the whole um, you know, project that God has entrusted to me and keep people under me in unity, in oneness, just love them, be nice to them. So lay aside every sin that entangles, ensnares us, sin, pride, jealousy, hatred, competition. You want to be there up in the front. You don't allow anybody else. You pull down everybody else. You know, it's I, me, myself, ministry, nobody else. Uh, you know, all of those things and, you know, uh, sins, secret sins, God knows we need to deal with it. Otherwise, that will uh, uh, stop us from running our race. What is the third thing? Run with endurance. Yes. Like I said, sometimes we don't feel very happy doing what God called us to do. We don't feel very excited what God has called us to do. We don't feel heavenly or anointing. Uh, for what God has called us to do. We don't uh, feel sometimes special excitement. Um, but, you know, we just have to endure to fulfill God's purpose. All we need to do at those times is just fulfill our responsibility and steward the gospel that God has entrusted to us. There can be high points, low points, but we don't go on our feelings. We don't let our feelings stop us from doing what God has called us to do. We run the race with endurance. Okay, so, you know, people around you might be doing things, you know, but you know, God has called you here. He has placed you here. You be, you continue, you focus on Jesus. You continue running your race. And it's the tough people who are willing to continue going on, even when the going gets tough. You know, uh, when I joined min uh, full-time ministry, you know, when I went to Bible college, you know, uh, you know, you all know that it was not something that I really wanted to be because it's not that I didn't want to, you know, do God's call. I, I love God. I was already teaching in Sunday school, but it was I felt I was not worthy enough to be in full time ministry. I didn't feel I was worthy enough. My life was not worthy enough or holy enough like other men and women of God uh, to be in full time ministry. That's why I said, no, God, you know, I can even serve you, but not be in full time ministry. But when I went to Bible college the first year, there was strike in our college. It was one of the best colleges. There was strike, there was division, there was two groups. But I didn't join into any group. That there, there was another price that I had to pay. It was daily sacrifices, you know. Um, and you know, they there was a there was a whole thing about uh, the the Bible college being shut down. You know, there was a, a fear. And everybody were asked to go back home in December, but I did not go back home because I was scared because if I go back home, you know, my father says, see, told you, that's why I didn't want you to go to Bible college. You know, and I couldn't face my father and I just stayed in Bible college and said, God, you wanted me to go to Bible college. You wanted me to be in full-time ministry. This is where you want me to be. You have to take care of me. I'm not going to quit this place. I'm going to be here. You know, you have to make things work. And of course, the Bible college started uh, January. We continued, uh, continued. Things were not easy. Things were difficult. But I always spent time. You know, I never ran away. I never gave up. 
I stayed there even though things were difficult, things were not easy. And I finished my six years and that taught me endurance. That taught me that, you know, in ministry, people are not angels, you know. They're not all perfect people. Come on. All of us are, are perfect. God handles us. God deals with us. In our church, we're not perfect people. We are all imperfect, but we're here to help each other, correct each other, you know, um, uh, build each other up. So we don't just quit and just don't leave. I didn't, I didn't see perfect people. And because I didn't see perfect people in Bible college, I didn't leave. I didn't run away. I didn't think, God, this is not where you wanted me to be. I'll go to some other Bible college. No, I stayed there. Because I know that is where God called me to be. This is where he wanted me to be. And, you know, I... Um, uh, you know, I stayed on and I and I continued there. God gave me the grace. He gave me the strength. He taught me precious lessons. And that is why after that, I faced many challenges, but I'm still stuck in the ministry for the last 22 years because I learned valuable lessons in my six years on campus in Bible college. So don't think, you know, everybody's perfect. Nobody's perfect. We're not angels here. We're not we're not God here. We're not Jesus here. We're all imperfect people, but we're all here to continue to build each other up and to help each other continue to run our race. So, so tough people who are willing to continue going on, even when the going gets tough. And then the last thing is look unto Jesus. Okay? We don't look to people. People will fall. So because of people fall, I can't keep moving Bible colleges. I can't keep moving churches. I can't keep moving mission organizations. If God tells me to move, you move. You know, and God taught me something. Once I wanted to move from an organization, Christian organization, God says, no, you will stay there and continue. And I stayed there and continued for one week. And again, after one week, I said, God, I can't. It's not a place where I can. And you know what God told me very strictly? Ministry is not a matter of convenience. It's a command. Ministry is not a matter of convenience. It's convenient for me. Food is convenient. Lifestyle is convenient. The hostel is convenient. People are convenient. I'll stay. Ministry is not a matter of convenience. It is a command. You know, it's a command. You stay there. You do what God is asking you to uh, do. And how do you get through your race? Looking unto Jesus. You look unto Jesus because he's the perfect person. He will help you to see and love others and accept others and love yourself and move on. Okay. The Apostle Paul says in Acts chapter 20, verse uh, 24, he says, or oh, you can read Acts chapter 20, verses 22 and 24, please. Somebody can read that. Yeah, read, read. Somebody who's not read who wants to read can read. We can hear some nice new voices. Thank you. Anand, so here it says we need to finish our race. We need to lay down our life. See what Paul says. But none of these things move me, nor do I count my life dear to myself. So he knows he's going to go to Jerusalem. The Spirit is telling him, and the Holy Spirit is telling him, you go to Jerusalem, you will face imprisonment, chains, is, you'll be imprisoned, you'll face many tribulations and difficulties. But Paul is saying nothing is going to move me. He's saying, I'm willing to give up my life. I'm willing to give up my life for the sake of the gospel. Okay. I'm willing to count my, not count my life dear to myself. I know persecutions, chains, you know, imprisonment, uh, tribulations uh, are there everywhere, but I'm willing to lay down my life. Look at what he says in Acts chapter 21 verse 13. Yeah, so, you know, all of them, uh, his, this, uh, all the people who love Paul, the ministry companions, saying, please don't go to Jerusalem. The Holy Spirit is always telling you you're going to be imprisoned and you're going to go through tribulations. And they're all weeping and mourning because he says, no, I have to go, you know. And then he says, you know, why are you crying? Because I'm, I'm ready to lay down my life for the sake of the gospel. Okay, Second Timothy chapter 4, verse 6 to 8, uh, Paul very beautifully says, he's writing to Timothy, you know, where he's, when he, where he's writing to Timothy from? He's writing from 
prison. He is imprisoned in Rome and he knows that he is going to die soon. Okay, he is not going to, his first Roman imprisonment, he was set free. The second time he knows he's not going to be set free, he's going to surely die. He's going to be martyred, it's going to be a terrible death. He knows that, but what is he saying? He's saying, I've been a drink offering, my time of departure has come. That means my end is coming near, it's drawing very near, it's very close. You know, but he said, what does he say? I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith. So wonderful. You know, we need to be also able to say that, you know, fought the good fight, finished the race, I kept the faith. And then he says, there's laid up for me a crown of righteousness with the righteous judge the Lord will give me on that day. Not only for uh, me, but to all those who have loved his appearing. So even as you pursue God's plan and purpose for your life, it's something that's wonderful, big, you know, uh, great. Uh, he'll reveal it to you. But enjoy the journey as you pursue God's dream for your life. And, you know, be sure to endure and to finish it so that you can receive your crown. Any questions? Hi, Krisha. I, I remember your question. I actually wanted to start the the... Um, the you know the morning the first hour by answering your question but you had not joined class so that's why I told uh, the rest of them that uh, we'll answer the question when um, you come when you join so I I do remember your uh, question now you know when we um, when we um, um, interpret something in scripture we always need to interpret it in the light of other scripture because one scripture always helps in interpreting other scripture if we take one scripture and interpret it out of in out of context in isolation you know that can uh, cause a lot of wrong doctrines and wrong teachings so when we look at some scripture we're trying to interpret something some way of living some lifestyle something that is being said there we always had to interpret it in the light of you know what was spoken earlier or what is also said in other passages of scripture so we keep them all together and then you have to interpret that scripture that you're trying to discern in the light of what other scriptures say. So if you look at, you know, uh, people saying that women have to cover their heads while praying or worshipping, it's actually they're taking it uh, from uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 3 to 16, where Paul is talking there about, you know, headship, spiritual headship and head covering. He's talking about spiritual headship and head covering and the context is writing this it's not in a context of you know that he wants women to cover their head but he's talking about spiritual headship he's talking about uh, god's spiritual uh, you know uh, uh, authority or god's uh, government in the local church so he's talking about god's uh, government uh, you know through which he establishes or he uh, brings about his exerts his influence or his blessing in the local church so you know all of us you know, are placed under god's uh, spiritual government or his uh, his spiritual headship in various areas of our life it can be in the family it can be in the local church it can be in the body of christ it can be at the workplace and we all need to uh, know what is god's um, uh, spiritual headship in the area that he has planted and placed us uh, so that we can recognize god's government and what and and when we recognize and submit to god's government in that specific place you know we can experience god's influence and his um his uh, blessing so here he is actually talking about in uh first corinthians chapter 11 verses 3 to 16 he's basically talking about the spiritual headship in in the in the body of christ so it says in the body of christ he's talking about the government in the body of christ he says in in the local church you know uh, 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 in the body of christ he's saying man is the uh, head of the woman Okay, and Christ is the head of man, and he says, you know, Christ uh, and God is head of Christ. Now, when we look at it, you know, we know that Christ and God are equal. You know, they are e they're equal. But here in God's government, you know, uh, God is God the Father is the head over Christ, just as Christ is the head of man, and as man is the head of the 
woman. So God, even Jesus Christ, willingly submitted to God's uh, government or headship in the body of Christ. Okay, and then he says in that context, he's talking about a woman ought to, you know, uh, cover her head. Uh, I think it's in verse um, in verse uh, ten, and here it's a cultural context. Okay, it's not uh, you know a biblical context because we don't see it anywhere in the Bible where a woman has to cover her head. So here is after pointing out that you know man and woman are co-equal, you know we are co-heirs of God. We both man and woman, you know, have the same Bible, experience the same blessings, the same spiritual gifts. Uh, we are called to different offices. There is no division in that. And then he goes on to talk about uh, the cultural context. And in the Corinthian cultural context was such that, you know, women typically had long hair, but married women would cover their head. Okay. And, uh, you know, the prostitutes had short hair or bald head. So if, you know, if you see a woman, you know she's a prostitute because she had short hair or a bald head. And, you know, she was a good character woman because she had long hair. And, you know, she was a married woman because she covered her hair. So it was actually, you know, uh, the cultural context. So here in this cultural context in the the church at Corinth, he's, you know, talking about uh, the headship and he's not, and Paul is instructing all women to cover their heads by praying or prophesying in the local church, but he does not mention this to the church at Galatians uh, or Ga uh, Galatia or uh, Ephesus or any other um, place, okay? And we also see in, um, I think in uh, verse 16, you know, Paul clearly mentions there, if anyone seems to be contentious, we have no such custom, nor do the churches of God. Okay, so he's saying this is not a custom that other churches of God follow. It's only a custom for the church at Corinth. So, you know, uh, we can't take this and, you know, uh, you know, interpret it out of context and say all women have to cover their church heads it, in all churches. It's mandatory. It's no, it's the cultural context that Paul is writing. And he's using that in the cultural context uh, to explain to the church at Corinth. And he's not saying that it has to happen in other churches because he says we have no such customs, nor do the other churches of God, you know, follow this. Okay. It's time up. Uh, thank you all for um, joining class. I hope I answered your question. Um, Trisha?